I was well aware that a filmmaker's second major film does set up all sorts of anxieties and is a very difficult act to follow if the first one was in any way successful. The film of the Draftsman's Contract um, did receive a certain amount of financial and critical success and there were certain expectations laid on this particular filmmaker to somehow repeat that success. But for a long time I'd been thinking about completely different ideas and I do think that audiences, certainly to begin with, were somewhat perplexed by this film. It's called a Z and Two Noughts and already with that rather complicated title you could see that all sorts of symbolisms and uh, attempts to be metaphorical and emblematic were certainly going to be part of the project. It has been said that because of its grand ambition that there are really three films struggling to get out under this one particular title. The first film, so-called, would be very much about notions of twinship. I think we're all fascinated by the notions of twins, the closest we could possibly get to meeting ourselves. The very idea of how you would behave if you met yourself, would you recognize yourself? Um, what would be the circumstances of a conversation? How would you handle all those people who were close to you? What, in a sense, would your relationships be? So this was one theme. And I suppose to take it to extremes, I was not simply interested in twinship, but uh, co-joined twins, so notions of Siamese twins. The second big area, um, I come from a background of uh, notions of uh, great interest in natural history. I'm very interested in filming and photographing natural history landscape, and I'm certainly interested in European landscape painting. And um, for a long time, I've been fascinated by evolutionary theory, and one of my grand heroes would certainly be Charles Darwin. So I wanted to make that exposition, again, remember, this is the early 1980s, about ideas of, of ecology and about the interrelationship of animals, plants, and humans. So there's a way that the second film contained here is rather like making an examination of the world as a zoo. Um, that's also a human zoo, of course, as well as being what would traditionally be regarded as an animal zoo. And the third big area of consideration, maybe even more academic than the other two, was my fascination with, I suppose, the prime constituent of cinema, which has to be the manipulation of light. Uh, I came across a quotation from Jean-Luc Godard who suggested that uh, the Dutch painter Johannes Vermeer was the first cinematographer because that's exactly what he did. He makes extraordinary manipulation essentially of the product of light. His subject matter is extremely simple, very stripped down, very economic, but gains its extraordinary magic and its uh, exuberance and ex exhilaration and aesthetic fascination because of the notions of playing with light. Um, my enthusiasm for Mir, I suppose, would also have come from an early stage when I was an art student in England because of his association with the golden age of Dutch painting, about 1590 to about 1670, and there were a great many exponents of landscape art in that particular area. There's a way also, I think, that um, over the years I've been deeply fascinated by Vermeer as a man as well as a painter. Very little is known about him. So there was room within, I suppose, the invisibility of the man that I could do a lot of inventing. So I invented Vermeer's wife, a woman called Catherine uh, Bolnath. I invented uh, other members of his family and his coterie and entourage, and also tried to resurrect one of um, the most famous uh, fakers of paintings of the 20th century, a man called Van Meegeren, who spent um, at least 10 or 12 years faking early Vermeers before he was finally discovered and put in prison. So here we have a film then about um, three big different uh, sub subject matters. I had to find a coherence to try and put it all together. This was my first collaboration with a brilliant French cinematographer called Sasha Vianney, who had made a reputation certainly working with my favorite French uh, film director, Alain René, but had also worked for many other Nouvelle Vague filmmakers and had been responsible for the cinematography in a film like Bunuel's Belle du Jour. He was fascinated, just like I was, about the sheer language of what cinema was, and we actually, I suppose, played, I suppose, and hoped serious games about the notion of light, about its source and how it works, 
and we actually sat down and made a list of 26 different ways that we could light a set. And if you look at the film very carefully, you can work out what those 26 different ways are. I cannot now at this stage remember them all, but it was, of course, lighting a set by morning light, afternoon light, moonlight, sunlight, starlight, but all sorts of forms of artificial light by bonfires, by candles, by lamps, and then a whole series of very contemporary ways of lighting by car headlamps, by cathode tubes, by all sorts of um, lighting which would probably only be used in industrial circumstances um, for things like heat cameras. Even, it was suggested somewhat metaphorically, we would try and light by the we would light a set by the light of a rainbow. And you watch very carefully, you will find that there's even an attempt to try and do that. So the film has a self-consciousness about film as language, and I think in many ways set me up for a lot of the experiments that I'd like to think that um, I had enjoyed and audiences had joined after this, in a way which um, I suppose would have brought me maybe to my present particular attitudes towards uh, the new revolution around the corner of um, the whole new vocabulary of moving image possibilities, but still, of course, looking over my shoulder at 107 years of uh, cinematic activity.